Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see you this morning. And we finished up our Easter series just this last week, and we're going to start something brand new. But I kind of wanted to go back a little bit because, you know, it's common for preachers to acknowledge the various holidays, you know, from the pulpit, like Mother's Day, Groundhog Day, Fourth of July. And we skipped a couple because of the pandemic or just because it didn't fit with the sermon series that we were in. So I want to go back really quickly to St. Patrick's Day. (laughs) The life of St. Patrick, I think, is a great illustration. And I love educating people about this man's life. Most notably, and most often forgotten, I think, was that St. Patrick, who is the saint, the, you know, the patron saint of Ireland, uh, was not Irish. <laughs> now, when he was 16, uh, Patrick and his friends were playing on the beach in Great Britain, and they were all kidnapped by a gang of Irish pirates. They were taken by ship and carried away in chains to Ireland, and there they were sold as slaves. And for six years, Patrick endured all the unspeakable horrors of slavery. And through the years, of course, he became filled with bitterness and rage and uh, wondered how he might plot his revenge against the Irish people. But at the same time, he was also coming to grips with his Christian upbringing. And rather than give in to hate, he decided that it was going to be more prosperous for him if he just released it all and turned his life over to Christ. So he bided his time until he could escape, and he ended up getting back to Great Britain uh, secretly aboard a boat. And for the next 20 years, he tried to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Would he spend his life in the past, reminiscing about his pain and uh, uh, you know, th- letting his former insurrection haunt him, or would he forge a new life ahead? And I think that's a question that many people struggle with. You might even have purchased a book about something like this, or sat even through another sermon series with a similar title. What is the meaning of life? How can I answer the question, for me, to live is what? What is the meaning? What is the meaning of life? How do I live a life that has meaning? How do I live a life that matters? As Patrick became a mature man, he also became a leader in his church until one day he became a bishop and Ireland became his mission field. St. Patrick became one of the most famous Christian missionaries of all time because he made a choice. He said, for me to live is Christ. He returned to Ireland with a passion to share Christ with the Irish people, people that he had once hated. And now his passion and his fanaticism for Jesus led to widespread revival. Christianity spread like wildfire. Irish missionaries were being sent out all over the world uh, to other nations. And and St. Patrick became the patron saint of Ireland. And the place that had once been his hell became his heaven. The other thing that St. Patrick is known for is a song or a prayer that he used to use to encourage his monks. This story is told that Patrick was evangelizing in Ireland and it wasn't all smooth sailing. Uh, Once when heading into the north of Dublin to a province called Meath, The king of that province was setting an ambush for Patrick and his monks. Legend says that Patrick sang a song as they snuck past the king and his army. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quite Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all who love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. I love that story. And I think for the most part, we all love those types of stories. 
But I also think that when you hear those stories, tales of great people, people who've done great things, a tiny piece of guilt creeps into our own life. We think, wow, that's amazing, what a great story. And at the same time, we're thinking, gee, what, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Did you know that Mozart composed his first symphony when he was eight? Alexander the Great, at 18 years old, had already begun conquering countries from Greece to Asia. Augustus Caesar became a Roman senator when he was 20 years old. Joan of Arc had already fought in wars by the time she was 17. Blaise Pascal invented the calculator at 19 years old. At the age of 20, Phyllis Wheatley became the first ever African-American woman to be recognized as a published poet. Mary Shelley published Frankenstein when she was 20. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein exposed the Watergate scandal when they were in their 20s. And Nadia Comaneci was 14 years old when she vaulted and swung and flipped her way to victory at the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal. She was the first ever gymnast to score a perfect 10 at an Olympics gymnastics event. And that year, she also accumulated three gold medals and six perfect scores at 14. How do you feel now? <laughs> How do you feel uh, you're doing with your life? How's your life going? Feel a little guilty? Now, despite what you might think, that's never my goal when I write a sermon. How can I make them all feel terrible? How do I make everybody feel super guilty about their life and what they're doing in their life? I, I know that I don't need to make you feel guilty because I think religion already makes you feel guilty. You ever get that guilty feeling after a sermon you, or after reading the Bible or maybe after an uh, inspirational story like the ones we just read, some super Christian? And I'm not trying to say that you should feel guilty right now. I mean, usually when you're in church, you feel pretty good. No, I'm talking about later when you have that moment to be alone with your thoughts, to be alone with God and you feel restless. Are you at peace with your life? See, I think the guilty feeling comes when we read this book, when we study this book, because the Bible calls me to do things that I know that I am not doing. The Bible calls me to be a person that I know I am not. The Bible shows me a life to live that I know I'm not living. Yeah, but that's why I come to church, so that I can be a better person. Okay, but are you? Are you a better person? Is church really doing that for you? Is it making you better? Or are we just playing a game here? I mean, are we truly being honest with ourselves? Sure, we know the right answer to give when the teacher calls on us, but you know, when it's just me and God, when I'm alone with my thoughts, when I'm alone with this book, am I at peace with my life? See, I think part of the guilt that we have comes from timidness. It comes from meekness and, and shyness. I think inwardly, we all know that fortune favors the bold, right? But then we look at our day to day and we realize, I don't live a bold life. Most of us are content to keep our head down, keep your nose to the grindstone, right? But I don't know. I mean, shouldn't we be more bold? Second Timothy 1 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I mean, it's not like we all don't know what we should be doing. I do. I know but a lot of stuff I should be doing gets put on the back burner. I probably should read to my kids at bedtime. I should pray with them, but it's just easier to watch a TV show together and send them off to bed. I know we should pray for every meal as a family, but it's easier just for everyone to eat at their own time. I know we should all go to church as a family, but it's easier just to attend when it fits our schedule. We're all very busy. 
I know I should read my Bible more. I know I should pray more. I know I should tithe more. I know I should share my faith. In fact, why do we even need a sermon series on the meaning of life or on what really matters? We don't. We all know what it takes. It's just easier to ignore those things. It's easier to ignore God. In fact, when I ignore God, it allows me to not be convicted of things. Because if the Bible or church convicts me, then I feel guilty, and ergo, I don't like feeling guilty. You know, when Stephen preaches to a crowd in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7 says he didn't pull any punches with his sermon. I'm going to read to you a portion of what he said. You tell me, how would you like it if your pastor preached this to you one Sunday? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You, who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Wow! (laughs) How do you think a sermon like that would go over? How do you think the crowd would respond upon hearing those words? Verse 54 says, Now when they had heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. See, what I like about Stephen is he preached boldly. He didn't stop and say, "Uh, what should I say? What's the best possible way I could say, you know, I really don't want to offend anybody. I can't say that. You know, I need to be politically correct. I need to be woke. Stephen wasn't afraid to hurt some people's feelings or to call them out. In fact, after he preached this sermon, they hit him with rocks until he died. Aha! Aha! Hmm, I knew there was a catch. Yeah, no thanks. Being bold gets you killed. Maybe. But I tell you what, there's nothing in this book that says play it safe. Or keep your head down. Or mind your manners. And Stephen was preaching to religious people. The most religious people. Which is funny. Or ironic. When you think about all of the things we're told as kids, you can't say that in church. Sorry, preacher. I shouldn't have said that in church. Stephen wasn't worried about offending anyone. In fact, he was trying to offend them. How will people ever know that what they're doing is wrong? if we don't offend them from time to time. Luke 6, 45 says, The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So, what comes out of your mouth, according to the Bible? Your heart. Or at least it should be. Maybe we should all stop worrying about what we're supposed to say or not say and just be okay with speaking from our heart. See, the thing that was on Stephen's heart was Jesus. He wanted to get the message of Jesus out and he wasn't worried or concerned about rehearsing the perfect script or even saying the right thing or not offending anybody. He just spoke from his heart. And the Bible says that what comes out of your mouth is a byproduct of what is already in here. See, in the discussion that we're having of living a life that matters, I think what matters is loving God and loving others. And the only thing that we should care about is Jesus. I mean, What is living a life that matters? It's a life of loving God and loving others. The only thing we should care about is the gospel. 
I want to look at some of Paul's writings as we finish this out today. First, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians, and then we're going to look at Philippians. Paul's going to expound a little bit more on this idea of what he believes uh, matters in the world. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Paul says, I didn't have a prepared script. (laughs) I didn't come with all the notes that I took in Sunday school or a workbook to read. He says in verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says the only thing that mattered was the message of Jesus. I I didn't let my own agenda get in the way. Verse 3, he says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. Paul even admits, right? Sometimes I don't even think I made sense. (laughs) I think some of us are afraid to speak out, to preach, to teach, to evangelize. Because we can't live up to the Bible heroes that are in our heads. We can't live up to the stories. But Paul admits, even I got afraid sometimes. My words were inadequate. You know what? I just allowed God to speak through me. And you know, even though he admits that it was done with fear and trembling, he still did it. Why? Because for Paul, the thing he was living for was Jesus. The only thing that mattered was Jesus. Now, elsewhere, in the book of Philippians, he says, In every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in that I rejoice. What matters to Paul? That Christ is preached. Good or bad. Right? And if it happens, he says, you know what? I'll rejoice. Rejoice just means celebrate. It means wave your hands in the air like you just don't care. Paul had uh, Jesus' rookie card (laughs) and uh, Jesus' bobblehead and the Jesus collector plates. Paul was a fan. Paul was a fan of Jesus. Where did Paul's boldness come from? How do you get to the point, like Paul, where you can just preach and teach and tithe and evangelize by being super in love with Jesus. By being such a huge, geek, nerd, fan for Jesus that you just can't help it. Paul is a super fan for God. I mean, we're talking about lives that matter, right? We're talking about the meaning of life. What do you think Paul would say? Ask Paul, what's the meaning of life? And he would say, Christ. Christ is the meaning of my life. He'd say, life equals Christ to me. I live because of him, so I live to love him. I live to serve him. Paul, what does that mean? It means everything. It means I, I, have, I eat so that I have energy, but to do his will. I, I sleep so that I'm well rested, so that I can be an effective tool, so that he can use me. I, I do all that I do. Everything I do is a means to be more effective for Christ. That's a fan. That's somebody who eats, sleeps, and breathes the thing that they love. And Paul's mission? He was president of the Jesus Fan Club. Is to hit the streets and just recruit more members. Hey, is there any particular person that you're looking for, Paul? Any person that fits kind of like the mold of what you think a Jesus super fan should look like? Galatians 3 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, you are all one in Jesus Christ. So anyone can join, right? Anyone can join, anyone can be a fan of Jesus, and Paul is ready to do anything to win those people. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 9. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. 
To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. For Paul, if you were a non-believer, he will heal you, pray with you, share the gospel with you. He would do anything that Jesus would have done. And if you were a Christian, if you were a fellow brother and sister in the church, he would help you bear your burden, he would give you counsel, he would guide you, and he would go out of his way to encourage you. He would do the same things that Jesus would do. Because why? Because of the very next thing he says in the book of Philippians. Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Paul, living a life that matters meant living a life that mirrored the life of Jesus. But we can still play it cautious, right? Because of the world we live in, you know, I don't want to rattle cages. I don't want to upset people. I want to be politically correct. No! Paul said, even if I preach a, ser a sermon like Stephen and they kill me, I live like Jesus, and if I die, well, then I guess I die like Jesus too. Paul says to die is gain. That means he's not afraid of death. How come? Well, because death is a promotion. You think life is good here? You think life is better here? You want to stay here? When Paul says in Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, those two halves of that passage, right? Those two sides, they equal each other because they're true. But they're true one because of the other. If I say to live is Christ, well, that's my priority. That's my goal, right? That's, that's my meaning. That's how I live a life that matters by having that right priority before me. Most people would say they live for money. It's true. I mean, I'm, I'm 53. I think about money a lot, uh, especially retirement. <laughs> especially, uh, how am I going to live in my old age, older age, and support myself and my family? How how can I make some more money before I die? <laughs> okay, but I can't live for money. I can't live for money because the moment I die, what do I gain? Nothing, right? What does money do for you after you die? Nothing. So once you die, you no longer benefit from that life. In fact, if you live for money, then death is kind of a threat to your existence. Maybe that's why Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the same would be true for any other priority, any other goal, anything else that you write in that line for me to live is patriotism, right? And to die is what? Nothing. Nothing. You lose patriotism in death. For me to live is sports, and to die is what? Nothing. Listen, for your life to have any sort of meaning or any purpose, it needs to be lived for something that survives death. Last Sunday was Easter. Do you think we'd be celebrating Easter if Jesus had not survived death? Of course not. Would any of us be here any other Sunday if Jesus hadn't, hadn't survived death? Of course not. But for Paul, Paul said, for me 
To live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul found the only meaning in life that is eternal, that survives death. To die is gain, he said. And that's why he could say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, because death does not rob him of Christ. Now, death actually joins him with Christ. These past years have sparked a lot of conversation about death. If people aren't dying from COVID, they are dying from mass shootings. I remember when mass shootings first got on my radar, and that was uh, 1999, Columbine High School. And if you were a Christian teenager, in 1999, the word Columbine does not just make you feel threatened in places where you shouldn't ever feel threatened. The word Columbine is also synonymous with Cassie Bernal because she is forever immortalized as the girl who said yes. Cassie Bernal was 17 when she was shot by Eric Harris at Columbine. And as far as I am concerned, she is another hero who did something amazing at a young age. And the story was told, Eric Harris asked Bernal if she believed in God in the moment right before he shot her. And she said yes. Michael W. Smith wrote a song about her. The chorus says, this was her time, this was her dance, she lived every moment, left nothing to chance. She swam in the sea, drank of the deep, embraced the mystery of all she could be. What if tomorrow? What if today? Faced with the question, what would you say? Cassie Bernal had said in a little movie clip that she made for school that she advances the kingdom by living for Christ. She said those words, you can, you can find it out on the internet. And I think that's the great challenge of the Christian life, is, is how all of life can be linked to Christ. So that everything that's in your life, your loves, your hobbies, your interests, your pursuits, everything, right? The total package of your life, how do you present all of that so that you can say, for me to live is Christ? But if you say, for me to live is something else, fill in the blank, then you have a problem. If you put in the word self, that makes you a self-centered person. And that means all of life revolves around you and not Christ. That won't make you like Christ because Jesus said, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Jesus didn't live a self-centered life. In fact, if you say for me to live is anything, anything you put in that blank, you fail. you fail life. If you get it right, you pass and you move on to a higher form of existence. And for all those people like Paul, they would tell you dying is gain. Advancement, promotion, better. Because now their entire lives will forever be about Christ. You know, their life was about Christ before, but now that they're dead, it's really going to be about Christ. The thing they loved in life becomes exploded and given to you a thousandfold in the next life. It's almost laughable, isn't it, that we need a sermon series on the meaning of life. I'm sure thousands of books have already been written on the subject. Thousands more sermons have been preached. But the meaning of life is really very simple. It's just one word that you write in that blank. And what you put there, what you 
live for determines your everything. One of the most famous Baptist preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said, I have now concentrated all my prayers into one, and that one prayer is this, that I may die to self and live wholly to him. It seems to me to be the highest stage of humanity, to have no wish, no thought, no desire, but Christ. You know, we started this whole thing off talking about guilt. And I think a lot of the guilt and hypocrisy that we feel comes from the difference between someone who says, yeah, I go to church, and someone who says, for me to live is Christ. When we become Christians, when we become Christians, we're adopted into this family and we take Jesus into our lives and we add him to our lives, just like we add going to church on Sunday to our week. But when we give him our life, I think we mature to a point where we say, God is a part of my life but I am a part of his. See, this is the great struggle of our time. This is the great war of our age. What is going to win your heart? Who is going to rule your heart? Who are you going to give your life to? See, perhaps there are people that say, for me to live is self. For me to live is things. St. Patrick could have said, for me to live is revenge. For me to live is what? What would you put there? The reason why the other things win in my life is because I don't see the daily need to answer correctly, how do I live a life that matters? I think a lot of us are content to not. Nobody says you can't unwind. Nobody says you can't enjoy sports. Nobody's saying you can't enjoy TV or hunting or, or any of those things. Just as long as we understand that those things are not the purpose of your life. They are not the goal of your life. Sports and TV and surfing and vacations and motorcycles and music, all of those things that we enjoy, those are the perks of life. They are the blessings of life. They are the fringe benefits of life. But we need to keep those things in their proper place. The blessings of life should never overshadow the one who blesses us. They should never become the center of life because they can crowd Christ out. Any good thing that becomes a rival and takes his place in my life is an idol. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Be, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Listen, as COVID starts to die off and fade away and people start going back to what we used to call life as normal, take a minute and just be honest with yourself right now. What do you love more than Jesus? The answer is going to be the thing that takes priority in your life. The thing that's more important when the rubber hits the road. And whatever that thing is, that's the thing that you're living for. Listen, your life is precious, valuable, important. You mean so much to so many. Don't go back to a normal life. Be abnormal. Be different. 
be bold. Don't go back to timidness or meekness or shyness. Embrace boldness. And stop listening to the voices that say you can't do it or that it's too hard or it's too dangerous or I'll do it later. Do away with the guilt about the life that you should be living and instead live that life. Be the person that God made you to be. Live a life that matters. Let's pray together. Father God, I can truly say with Paul, I know the thing that I ought to do, and I don't do it. So I would just ask for your daily encouragement. Don't give up on me. I want to live a life that matters. I want to live a life that pursues you and is all about you. I love you. And I want to spend my life loving you. I want my life to be more about you every day. It is hard. It's hard to listen. It's hard to focus. The struggle is real. Don't give up on me. I want to be everything that you made me to be. I want to be all that you created me to be. Lord, with the support of my friends in this church, And just ask that you would grow me and mature me into the child of God that you need me to be. I want to spend my life loving you, serving you, and showing more people what being a Christian looks like. Thank you for your blessings. May they never be too much in the foreground that they obscure my vision of you. Help me to put you in the proper place in my life. Above all things, in the front of everything, in the foreground of all things, forever and always, because I love you. I love you so much. Thank you so much for being my father, my friend, my God, my King. Amen. Thank you for spending this morning with us. Thanks for uh, hanging out this Sunday and uh, sharing a moment. Uh, This is a sermon series we're going to do for the next couple weeks. I think it's going to be seven or eight, nine weeks long. And so again, uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast or if you're watching this on YouTube, it's just a a little address, right? It's a web address, a URL. You can always clip and copy it, post it to your own wall so that other people know how you spent your morning. Or you could post it to a friend's wall if you think they might benefit from it. I love you guys and I'll see you next week. Bye.